I have some guys from Louisiana on the phone call. They're at the plant, so we're going to get them involved in a few minutes. The guys on the phone are with CBNI and an unnamed plant, but Charlie's with CBNI uh, and they're at a plant in Louisiana. Charlie, you there? Yes, sir. Uh, would you introduce yourself and the people that are there? Yeah, I work for CBNI and the Reliability Department out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I manage the Tango program, and we all work together every day. We've got a maintenance motor management system, and Mr. A.C. Cummins, and I'll let you guys introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is uh, Ed Gould, and I'm the reliability engineer here at this plant. I have a guy come on board with us. I'll let him introduce himself. My name is Kerry Snell, and I'm also a reliability engineer. All right, thanks. There's a lot associated with predictive maintenance programs, as you all know. The biggest thing is, you know, how many times have you been asked to justify the uh, investment in the program? Same program start and stop many times. They'll start, they'll do well, they'll lose funding, they'll lose support of management, they'll get laid off, the program dies three or four years later, the program's back. I've seen that cycle way too many times. I mean, that's one of the things we definitely want to find a way to get around. Another thing is the experience drop balls, the machines fail even when they're identified. Again, that's usually a sign of communication problems associated with the program. Uh, how many people in the plant know about your condition issue? just a few or is it very widely spread information? Uh, does your program have buy-in from operations and management? Is your reliability program resource limited? Are they holding you back from more machines, more technologies? Uh, and I think you're going to see in talking to these guys today at the plant, their cost benefits program really helped them in gaining more resources for the program. Does your plant corporate management understand the pure value? And do you have a PDM program or condition-based maintenance program? In my mind, anyway, a PDM program kind of sits off on the side and does their own thing. A condition-based maintenance program is when they're so integrated into the plant maintenance structure that the plant couldn't do it any other way. I've seen both. Uh, I've seen plants where it's just really integrated and nobody would even consider not having predictive maintenance as, as part of the team. And I've seen them over to the side where they could go away and the plant would still operate about as, as normal, maybe not have the, the predictive part but still have the same PMs and so forth. Eastman Chemical, and they threw this in a paper we did a, a few years ago. And so they said their first year or so, they were about 10% of everything they found had a problem, or 10% of everything they monitored had a problem. By year 10, they were around 3%. What happens in a lot of cases is somewhere in here, year three, four, five, uh, I've seen a lot of programs uh, lose funding and lose resources, and that's because Back here, reliability is hurting them at 10%, and a lot of machines are failing. When they get their program to where 3 4% are failing, everybody starts saying, hmm, what's the, what's the value of these guys? Uh, nothing ever failed. Why do, we, why do we need them? Why do we keep them around? So, again, that's kind of the basis for where we are today is that what can we do to make sure everybody knows our value and they know, to know that even though we're not having any more calls at 10, after 10 years, 10 year uh, maturity of our program, calls aren't very high. Uh, there's not a lot of machines failing or even heading toward failure. There's still a huge value of the program that we have to, uh, to show our management. Again, there's lots of uh, approaches, but the one we found best is to maintain information on, on costs, actual costs, and avoiding costs, and we'll get into that in a moment. What we're going to talk about today is kind of a case study from uh, CBI Plant Services. CBI is Chicago Bridge and Iron. They run a, um, a service organization where they're uh, in plants with technical people helping them with uh, reliability programs. CBI does a lot more than that, but the uh, group we're talking to is the plant reliability. The client's a petrochemical facility in Louisiana. CBI has provided condition monitoring services for about a year, uh, two and a half years to this site. What they provide is vibration analysis, oil analysis, ultrasonics, motor management, infrared tomography, and visual inspections. Charlie, you want to pick up and talk about the program? Yeah, we started uh, cold out here around June the 24th. We had to build a uh, vibration database, 534 machines. It's about 538 now. And we created the monthly, the quarterly, and the uh, weekly. The weeklies are the critical. Along with that, about July, I started building a tango base route for route in the areas. We got going with lubrication. They, they already had a lubrication program started by oil sampling, 
just like this statement in the presentation says, we we got gearboxes, hydraulic units, air compressors, refrigeration, and bulk storage all being monitored. And I'm going to let Ed step in if he wants to say anything. He's he's heading up the lubrication program, and I'm assisting him. Yeah, on our lubrication program, we were doing about 60 samples a month on major pieces of equipment that had enough oil in the system to be sampled. We don't or sample anything that's got eight ounces of oil in it, but we were sampling for quite a while. And before we had, uh, actually, we, we were getting sample results back before we went through any formal uh, training. So we were just responding to basically the particle counts, the water, and wear metal. We weren't really looking at too much other of the sample results. But September, a year and a half ago, we do uh, MLT training and learned a good bit more about directions we wanted to take with our lubrication program. So we implemented a program where we don't add an ounce of oil to any piece of equipment now without it being filtered first, new oil. We have bought quite a few uh, panel units with filtration and pumps on them that now we respond very quickly to samples that have high particle counts in it. We recently justified purchasing a dehydrator so now we can quickly respond to some of our larger reservoirs that, for whatever reason, get moisture in them. So uh, our lubrication program has come a pretty long way in the last year and a half. We have several KPIs that we're tracking the results of our, <clears throat> our lubrication effort now, and we're beginning to see some real good results from those. The, all samples are reviewed on a monthly basis, and we respond to them. We have two lube techs here in our plant. We have weekly Lube Tech meetings. We also have on Monday morning a short little 15 minute or so meeting that we lay out our weekly schedule for our Lube Techs. So the, the two Lube Techs know exactly what they're expected to accomplish during that each week. So it's, it's really come a long way in the last uh, year and a half. We're really making some good progress on lube storage and lube uh, cleanliness. As you'll see in a little bit, I suppose, some of our savings and some of our justification for the program allowed us to purchase a lube storage building, transitioning to where all of our lubrication will be stored indoors in a controlled environment. We'll have the ability to filter the oil as we receive it. Some drums are both circulated through some filters while we're storing it and then also filter it as we dispense it. Cleanliness levels are coming up, uh, uh, improved a whole lot in the last six months to a year. All right, so in the last year, you've gotten a lot of new resources in the program. It, you essentially justified those resources from past saves? That's right, that's exactly right. All right, well, we're gonna talk, we will talk about more, that documentation of that more in a few minutes. Uh, another thing that they're doing at the site is motor management, and again, that was started later in the program. They decided that that would give them some savings. In 2013, they had 31 repairs totaling 140,000. 2014, they had 26 repairs, a little less money. In 15, they had half the number of repairs, a little less, for 67,000. This year, they have no repairs so far, and so they're doing a lot with the cost of uh, motors uh, repairs or motor replacements. Charlie, you have somebody that wanted to say something on the motor management? Yes, sir. If you go back to, say, two slides, one more, you're right there. I, I started seeing while I was taking data, a lot of hot motors, noisy motors, dirty motors, alignment, and then uh, as I was writing condition entries, a lot of them were on motors. I said, you know, you guys really need to think about a motor management program. They, they couldn't keep track of them. It was... If we had one, where is it? Do we have one? Do we not have one? And everything from price, prices were different, buying motors all over the place. So I'm going to let AC come and step in. He's our motor management program manager, and I know he's got a few things to say. Well, we basically come in and set up some standards. We wrote some procedures on minimum requirements for purchasing motors or rebuilding motors. By setting up that standard, we let the uh, maintenance people know that we were going to start requiring certain steps to be taken before we changed a motor or before a motor was rebuilt. With the procedures in place, we also went out and we surveyed three of the local motor shops and determined the 
condition of their shops and we let them know that we now had a minimum standard that they would adhere to if they got the bid to repair the motors. And along with that in the inventory cleanup and just basically putting an eye on each and every motor out in the plant, we actually turned it around in about 18 months and now it's, it's in really good shape right now. We're, we're managing that, keeping the procedures up to, uh, to snuff and and just watching what's going on. And with Charlie's vibration program and the motor program, we've improved it quite a bit. Thanks, AC. Hey, Charlie, or you guys, would y'all talk about SAP? I write work orders in SAP for vibration work orders, and I entered that information in Tango. I'm constantly looking at Tango and SAP. I look at when the motor was worked on or when the pump was worked on or whatever, whatever work was done. I go out there and take fresh readings and then I'll check the uh, tango portion off and I'll look at SAP again. Also, lubrication, I have a holography and I'll review the samples, but most of the lubrication management is through SAP work orders and schedules. The question was asked about an interface. Most of the large clients that use our program do interface with SAP or Maximo. You know, they press a button to create a work order from one back to the other. At this point, they haven't gotten there yet. I don't know uh, in the planning stage or not. No, as far as we don't have a direct connection between uh, Tango and SAP, Charlie kind of does that on his own right now. But the historical information in SAP on each piece of equipment is, uh, you know, we look at the history on individual pieces of equipment pretty frequently, especially the ones that are rated more highly critical. One thing that AC has done for us through the effort of positively identifying every motor that's driving every piece of equipment here, and then uh, reviewing that information with our criticality list, he has ensured that we have the proper amount of spare motors on inventory. Before he got here, we, we had motors just, you know, stacked anywhere, parked anywhere in, in sheds and buildings around. And now we have a organized motor storage area. As a matter of fact, we're, we're just now getting approval to build another $150,000 motor storage building just to store spare electric motors in a location in that building. Uh, in the current inventory as well as in the new building, each location is, is identified in SAP, so you can look on our uh, equipment uh, records and see exactly what spare motor, if there's a spare motor, where it's located. In addition to that, he's gone a step further and he does a PM on those spare motors to make sure they're rotated on a frequency, stored properly, and kept clean and dry and all that sort of thing. So, some of the most unreliable plants, and in some plants I've been in, are in the storeroom. So, it's, it's storeroom procedures are very critical. All right, yeah. uh, on this particular slide, it's just showing the count of equipment faults, and you see the motors are the highest fault with almost 250 condition problems that they found over what the two and a half year period. The bearings, <laughs> centrifugal pumps, gearboxes, so forth. Considerably less. So motors are definitely their their high failure item in the, in this particular plant. That's what justified us, you know, trying to get a motor management program out here, and it, it came through. So we're full time right. now. Charlie, we have a question or two. Let's let's grab those for a moment. Uh, so motor is a pretty vague uh, description of the problem. Do you have any details? You know, well, down? yeah, the bearing, winding, the electric problem. You can, uh, I mean, yes, you have the capability to sort problems by machine type, by area, by machine type, you know, by stock number if you wanted to. Uh, so there's lots of ways to, to slice and dice the information once you've got it. There was another question. It's uh, reliability information management. It turns out that CMMS is you don't do a very good job with reliability information. That's because a lot of reliability happens before and after a work order. So Tango is kind of a information management system that pull everything together that you previously have been doing with emails and spreadsheets and bring it into one database for the reliability information. In fact, Charlie, what were, what were y'all doing before Tango there? Was it mostly emails and spreadsheets? As far as I know, uh, Tango was implemented here for the first time. I guess basically they used emails and SAP. That's correct. Yeah. 
Well, most of our clients are large facilities with SAP or Maximo or Oracle CMMS, and we've interfaced with those and lots of others as well. Most typical interface is essentially just creation of a work order. You, once you've got the information in Tango, you you know you click a button to write a work order into SAP, you get the work order number and the techo information back. What's more applicable to very large organizations? I don't know that I'd say that. Uh, it's, well, it's working here. I'll tell you that. Well, that's All another right. thing that the motor management program brought to the table. We actually went out and tried to identify the root cause of the motor failure when they were just replacing motors. Without any history, we determined whether or not it was lubrication, cleanliness, motor fatigue. All those items were not being captured as history as why the motor failed. And when we got that information, we were able to determine what needed to be approached and how to approach it to reduce the number of failures. Yep, and that's the next heading anyway is make sure you get an autopsy on all the critical equipment failures. You got to know why it's failing. You, uh, you know, you have a, a winding failure in a motor, and the plant says, gee, the winding's failed. When it gets to the shop, the winding's failed because it had water in the wind. Well, obviously, your problem is sealing and water than not winding. So uh, you got to get to that root cause. Just I wanted to show you, this is not from the plant Charlie's at, but this is this is an autopsy. This is a crusher motor autopsy. You see that they've talked about this is a 300 horsepower, 405 P-frame motor advantage service sense. So 961 days, bearings fell apart, and their problem was that they couldn't lube it. It was uh, lube was it was inaccessible for lubing, and you can see that what they've done on autopsy is just uh, not not pretty. This is 30 horsepower DC motor. It had a commutator problem. So anyway, they're out to solve these problems. And one of the things that this plant does, it has a for the plant that we're talking. Nope, different plant. Sorry, sorry to mix things up. This was a good time to give you an example of an autopsy. I had it from a different plant. I didn't have it from uh, uh, from these guys. Is this, uh, is this in Tango or is this in some separate root cause analysis? What the autopsy? Yeah, the autopsy report. Yeah. What Tango asks you to do is give you a failure progression, and so anything that fails, I want to know the primary cause of failure down to the root cause of failure. Because later we're going to say that uh, you've got so many lubrication contamination problems, water problems, and if you see a lot of drive-in bearing failures in an area, you might say, oh, you need better alignment tools. So we're going to, we want to get to that root cause. And again, I'm just showing you what a different plan uh, does on their autopsies. In fact, here's a sheet that they require their repair vendors to give them on autopsies. One of the things that this particular plan told me is that they've struck a deal with their motor repair shop that all all motors will get autopsied and the uh, shop can have the price of the copper in exchange for doing the autopsy. So that seemed like a good, a good arrangement. All right, so April 2014, uh, they started their cost benefit program. And Charlie, you want to talk a little bit about getting that set up and going? Yeah, we started it, like it says, April 2014. The way I started was I taught the Ed, the reliability manager, to get some information on parts and pieces and past repairs, how much it costs. Then I've got a production maintenance coordinator I go to. He gives me some downtime figures, and we plug that in. Sometimes we can't use it because they got spares, you know, pump A and pump B. And then uh, I go to SAP to get the actual hours spent and any, any movement of goods, you know, material. Then I'll go either to a AC or the motor shops. I got two or three I talked to. I need to get a price on a rebuild, a rewind, or a brand new one. All that is in the motor management program, and it, it helps out in uh, cost benefit. AC may have a, another couple comments on that, but uh, we just need the pieces and prices and what's what's going on with the motor. I like the first comment, we're looking basically but at the difference between what what could have occurred versus what actually did happen. In other words, if, if the vibration analysis, lubrication program, and the thermal imaging, and motor management, all that, <coughs> identified a problem early, and we were able to limit the cost of the material to repair that job and limit the amount of labor that it took to repair it by catching it at an early stage, rather than wait till it catastrophically failed, 
when it catastrophically fails, that greatly extends our downtime because of plant cluggage and what it takes to unplug the plant is pretty extensive. So uh, we, we really can benefit from catching it early and taking advantage of basically making a, a unscheduled, unplanned job a planned job when production can give us that piece of equipment with minimum amount of outage and impact on their schedule. So that's really where the most of the savings comes from. One of the um, things that we ask, or one of the things that you need when you're calculating actual cost versus avoided cost, what it would have cost if it had gone to failure, is production loss. How much production loss did you have associated right. with, with the plan repair versus? And so tell me a little bit about where you get the production numbers from. We have a production maintenance coordinator that tracks all of our downtime. He tracks downtime due to maintenance. And he also tracks the, the rest of the reasons for plant downtime. But uh, that's he's the, probably the primary guy that Charlie gets most of his information from as far as costs are concerned for the repair, for the actual repair, all that comes right out of SAP. Yeah, we have a guy, part of his job is to track downtime and keep those records. He's, of course, got a lot of plant experience. He knows if you lose an agitator and plug up a tank from experience, he knows that that's an extended downtime to unplug, to clean out, and to get going again. So he's the one that pretty much estimates loss production. Like I said, the cost for the repair comes straight out of SAP. You know, we kind of use vendors and that sort of thing to get the cost for a comparison between, say, putting a bearing in a motor uh, versus rewinding a, a 100 horse motor or whatever. So we have all those all those figures available to us from the vendors to us. All right, so let's, let's look at a few results. When they start calculating actual costs and avoided costs, cost if it, it uh, proceeds to failure, you start getting these numbers. These include parts, labor, production, and probability of occurrence. So the failure numbers are factored by probability. Like if you think it, it would have failed half the time the way you said that, you may uh, factor in that probability. This runs for a little more than a year. It looks like that their costs were about a little less than a million. If it had gone on to failure, they're calculating 2.8 million. And so that's showing 1.95 million, almost $2 million of avoided savings. Charlie, why don't you, you guys take it and talk about that a little bit. Yeah, we, uh, we, like we started in 2014, I take each condition entry and turn it into a cost savings. And like I said, I go, go to these three or four guys. And actually, some of these figures are conservative. Like Ed was talking about an agitator and a tank plugged up. It's usually about a four-day turnaround. I plugged in three, you know, just to be fair. I used the probability of the, the occurrence. I try to stay at 100, but I do get down in the 80% because you never know what's going to happen. This is our third year. We've got about $4.02 million in the kitty right now as far as avoidance, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So let's talk about the progression. You know, how did you get from no cost avoidance information to where you are now? And I know that it came along with quite a bit of getting the plant to buy in and be to assist you in that. Well, I came to Ed and showed him this program. I said, my boss, Scott, wants me to start using this so we can justify our existence. He bought into it from day one, as far as I know, and we've been going back. He, I come to him most of the time when i got a big dollar one to do. We'll iron it out and get everything together. And he, you know, he said, yes, let's go with it. Yeah, it's, uh, we don't track every little incident. We may be, at some point in the future, expanding to tracking more smaller cost savings. But initially, you know, when we, when we would have a major problem, we would track those costs and that uh, cost avoidance. As Charlie got more familiar with, with the tracking uh, package in Tango, we, did, we started doing more and more. So, you know, initially, we kind of eased into it a little bit. But once we started seeing the value of it, started making, we, uh, we were so confident in those cost avoidance numbers, we started uh, making presentations to management here. As a matter of fact, our factory manager is using these numbers, but he's making a presentation to our owner and our major financial people this week on this very program. He doesn't normally have a lot of opportunity to spend a lot of time with the owners and managers, so he picks and chooses when he has that opportunity. One 
particular aspect of the operation of the plant here. And this month, the reliability program and the benefits of the reliability program is what he has chosen to present to our upper management. So we are really, it's surprising the more that management finds out about what we're doing, the more on board they get and the more they're willing to give us approvals to buy things like loop storage buildings and dehydrators, thermal image cameras and, and that sort of thing. So yeah, that's basically this savings program is what's driving our improvement really. Obviously the cost avoidance numbers are impressive. But I'd like to factor in the cost of the program itself, the equipment, the labor, uh, the software, all of those uh, investments. Yeah, his question is that when you throw the cost of the program, your your, your technologies, uh, your equipment, your software, your people all together, then how does the savings look at that point? You know, when we first brought Charlie on, prior to that, we were using a outside firm that we uh, contracted with. We had limited success with that company because we did not have any on-site data analysis capabilities here. We would just gather the data, download it. It would go, I think, somewhere. There was an analyst, I think, in Washington State somewhere that was doing our analyzing of the vibration analysis stuff. We were uh, finding that the data uh, all we were getting back was, hey, you need to go take a look at this. You've got a problem. It wasn't tracking any trends. It wasn't tracking any uh, real useful data other than you got a problem. Go take a look at this. So we really felt like we wanted to have our own analyst here on site, that that would be a big improvement, really cut down on our response time. And then when we looked at the Tango options as far as trending and keeping track of and the history and the condition of entries and all that sort of thing. When we went from the outside contractor that we were using to having a full-time analyst here, there wasn't much difference in that cost at all. So it was kind of a, a no-brainer for us to bring in our own analyst and have, have Charlie here full-time. That part of our program was fairly easy to uh, justify initially. And then, uh, you know, as we started seeing results, of course, that just confirmed that we did make, you know, made the right decision. But, and as far as the motor management problems that we were having, they were, it was just total chaos. We didn't know if we had spares. We didn't know if we needed spares. We didn't know what bearings were being run in motors. We didn't know what our repair shops were doing. It was total chaos for a, a good period of time. And now that when we had such good results from the vibration program. We started saying, hey, you know, we've, we've got a lot of room for improvement for motors. We initially, we have basically three production units here, and we, we brought the motor management system online with an agreement with management that we, we just wanted to do it in one of our units as a pilot plant, you know, as a pilot trial effort. After a year or so of just running one unit and seeing the benefits there, it, it became pretty obvious that we wanted to go plant wide. To say how much we are spending on uh, our effort here, I don't know that we've really kind of compared that number too much because it evolved over time. Uh, maybe now is a good time to go back and look at that. For us here, we've kind of justified each step of the program as we went along. Uh, the display that's up is uh, just a dashboard of open condition problems. You get it ranked by severity, whether it's got a work order, latest status comments, whether they're keeping track of where they stand with completion of this work order. This is kind of interesting in the fact that quite often these things are discussed in staff meetings and right there at the staff meeting they'll start putting in the status comments of what's leading them or where they're heading to, uh, to resolve the problem. Once the problem is resolved, the work order is completed, then uh, they have the ability to enter avoided cost information. So this is just talking about the problem. This is kind of the head, the top of that display uh, entry screen uh, where they're talking about the vibration readings and so forth. The next screen is letting them put in actual costs, labor, transportation, more labor, parts, and then projected costs with labor and parts and, and comments associated with that. 
No, it's, uh, it's plain and simple. I'm glad you guys made it that way, but it's just the, doing the legwork. I call on the top when I called the motor shop, got a price on uh, remote motor repair, and of course they charge us some transportation. And then you just build each one of those uh, blocks, go from your actual to your projected cost, and you come up with these figures here. These next ones are three, four different technologies. And you know, once you've got the information in, you can start dividing it up or slicing it and dicing it in a lot of different ways. Here's savings by technology. You see the vibrations contributed to most, but oil and thermography haven't been going as long, so they're, you know, they're yet to add a lot to that. But anyway, you can also break it up by types of equipment, by area of the plant. Uh, there's lots of ways you can break up the cost information once uh, you start capturing it. I like how visual inflation actually shows up. This is, you know, just something that's like so basic that. And, and, and again, it could be a no-brainer, but it should yep. actually show well, up. It's a, it's a predictive technology. We try to do the capture of that with tablets, so that makes it a little better, a little easier to maintain information than just you know paper and clipboard. Real quick question on the downtime and the tracking monitoring you're doing. Are you to the point where you're trending the mean time to failure rate? I'd have to go into their database to pull that up. I don't have it on a slide, and so I don't think I'll do that right now. But yes, the mean time between failure, like for example, in their motor management program, the mean time between failure is calculated between the time they install it and the time they remove it. So you get a mean time between failure, mean time between repairs, root causes of failure, all that. You know, your, your basic reliability measurements of MTBF, cost of failure, root causes of failure are all, are all there. Uh, and this is just talking about the progression of, of how they started out for their program. They, they did a few cases per week to start off with. That started uh, getting people interested in, in the, the cost tracking part of the program and, and putting the work into that. So they expanded it from there. Charlie, you want to talk a little bit about, I know you, you did that earlier, but the growth of the program from a few entries to where you are now? Yeah, I've spent, uh, spent a good bit of time the first maybe 20 because I was just learning about it and trying to get my you know thoughts together and as I went to these four individuals five individuals it started getting easier and easier you just got to sit down and get the numbers all in front of you and just knock it out it, it doesn't take 10 minutes to do it but it may take two days to get the data you know or a day but just sit down and start doing it and it'll, it'll come come easier and easier you'll, you'll see your cost savings reveal the only thing I, I can think that we I'd like to do is alignment. We've done probably 150, 175. I need to look at plugging in the horsepower and kilowatt hours and the amperage, and you, that's a big cost savings right there. And it reflects the motor and the pumps condition too. But it's just so intensive. You know, you got different horsepower motors, different you know voltage, different amperage. So it's it's a formula you got to stick with and you know, do it, do it the same way all the time. Uh, advocate another communications tool that, that uh, you guys don't use, but a, a different client does, and I thought, of, thought, thought highly enough of it that I wanted to uh, show it. This is their find of the week, and uh, as you can see, find of the week is uh, uh, cost savings. They uh, they have in what technology and background. This looks like a ultrasonic air problem, thermography problem. In this particular case, they write it up, they get down to some cost savings at the bottom uh, where they're talking about the fact that if this breaker had burned up, it would have cost them about $11,000, but it actually only cost them $125 to fix the breaker switch. In the case of this client, which isn't the one that we're, we're talking to right now, they distribute this finds of the week every week. They, they find one of their problems, they write it up, they distribute it to the plant. They think that's a big key to their success <coughs> as well as just letting everybody know uh, what they're doing and, and what they're saving. We get, uh, I send it in all the, the Tango reports, the condition entry reports, and uh, he looks at that too. It's pretty interesting how much AC and myself are finding the lube guys, you know, they report problems too. So I like this, uh, I like this approach, this weekly uh, find of the week. Sometimes, I mean, the only thing that we're, well, one of the things we're doing now is when, when Charlie reports a problem, say it's a high vibration due to alignment or whatever, and then we schedule a, a couple of craftsmen to go out and realign that pump, then he'll send me the results, and you'll see the levels of the vibration drop down a lot. 
Well, our plant manager has now become really interested because he can relate to a line that peaks and then drops way down back in below the normal range. So he's gotten to where he kind of expects to see those kinds of results. And if we could formalize that a little bit more, that would be even better. But Charlie is pretty good about, you know, following up on we reported a problem, we repaired the problem, and this the results of us fixing it. That would be even more helpful to do this kind of a thing. All right. I think we're ready for, for questions. Uh, we got about five minutes left. Any any questions? Sure. Yeah, so on cost avoidance, do you wait until the repair is executed to take that credit? Or do you, do you, in other words, do you pull those numbers and say this is our cost avoidance before the, the repair has been executed? Or is it post-execution of the repair? So normally, to get actual costs, you're going to have to um, you know, go to SAP and pull the actual parts and hours out. So you, the repair has usually been completed to get actual costs. Uh, I assume you could do the uh, avoided cost before if you wanted to. In the program, it actually gives you the link to start putting the information in once you've done a closure because we don't, we try not to put everything on the screen until you need it. And so it appears then, but you can get to it other ways. Charlie, uh, the question is when do you do the cost avoidance calculation? After I know the work order's been closed, the work's been done, I've taken vibration readings everything's good, then I'll start on it. Sometimes it may take a week or two for the SAP people to close the work order, and I can't get the cost, and I'll wait until actually I can get the total, the actual cost, and I go from there. Start. Then we'll go to the production coordinator and Ed or AC, the motor management guy, or I may call myself, but I really wait till equipment's repaired and somebody can do a, a you know, rep repair check on it. All right. Next question. Yeah, this is uh, maybe a little bit of a strange question. The plant manager here seems to be pretty supportive of the program. I'm wondering what his what his background is. Is, is he a technical person? Did he come up through the engineering maintenance ranks? Or I don't know whether you heard that, guys. But uh, the question is, the plant manager, what's his background? How, um, why is he supportive of the program? Uh, he, he's not from the mechanical side of our business. He, he's always been a production-oriented person. I think he came up, I'm not sure what his early background is, but I, I know he came up through uh, the production ranks in several plants before he became plant manager here. Okay. Uh, as far as I know for a fact, he's, he's a very decent, knowledgeable guy. He's interested in the program. He stops me in the street or out in the plant or comes to the office or comes to Ed or in a hall and he's very interested on what's going on and how we're doing it and he's always telling us we're all doing a good job. Good. Management support is absolutely critical. You got to get their buy-in. Uh, early, yeah. early on, year, a few, well, several years ago, 10, 15 years ago, we worked a lot with Eastman Chemical. Uh, we still do. But in those days, Eastman Chemical had a VP that was uh, very focused on reliability, and it just made all the difference in the world, and Eastman's now a world-class organization when it comes to reliability, mainly because they had a VP that said, you are going to do this. Well, I think you just put those people everywhere. That's yep. great, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah. How do you justify, or how do you, you have to justify pre-filtering and nutrition All right, pre-filtering of your loops. Uh, how do you justify that? Machinery Loop Tech 1 seminar that we went to, one of the first things the instructor said, and this was with our, our lubrication supplier representative sitting in the back of the room, one of the first things he said was that new lubrication that you receive from your distributor, whether drummed or bulk, basically is not fit for industrial lubrication kind of caught everybody's attention with that statement, but then he showed, you know, some of the results of new oil filtering, and if you look at the micron count on the ISO uh, particle count, you see some need for filtering the oil. These guys aren't the only ones. I know a number of our clients are doing uh, pre-filtering of bulk oil as they come in. So. Do they test the oil as it comes in? But, uh, I'll ask, have to ask him. I know that, uh, again, other clients will do a, um, a sample when it comes in and compare it to the reference. That either becomes their reference sample or they compare it to a known reference sample. We get bulk shipments about every two weeks, and we retain a sample 
of that shipment. We don't uh, necessarily send it off for analysis, but once a month we sample that bulk tank and send it out for analysis. So if we discover a problem on that monthly sample, we, we have to retain individual shipments that we can go back and you know further investigate if we find a problem. You know, most of the time it's just, you know, when the distributor transfers it from tank to to a truck to drums, you know, to our tank, all those transfers, you know, you're gonna pick up some contamination and that's the point of, of filtering it before you use it. Next question. Yeah, we are with uh, the cutbacks and refinery and uh, re refineries and the petroleum industry right now. That problem uh, is very it's poised to actually get worse before it gets better. So filtering makes if it makes sense today. It'll certainly make sense tomorrow. All uh, right, you got some supporters here. Uh, <laughs> All right, next. Yeah, we got the next question here. So to that point, um, you know, and Rendell runs the Lily's Lily's lubrication program and talks about all of this, so we can talk to her in a little more detail here, but one of the things that was discussed is typically the five gallon pails we don't filter because they're too small or we're not able to, or it's really the pail that um, is the plastic, they're typically pretty good, but what we recently found is with the refrigeration oil or some compressors, it's very expensive oil, that yeah. something is the big core, I mean, to the point where we were getting just a very level of floor coming back from the, uh, the sample, and we I finally convinced the, the group to sample that five gallon pail, and it was so bad that it's like you, you, you're, you're, you're bad before you even start. So, even refrigeration type oils, you may need to consider filtering. Yes, yes. You're All right. right. Any more questions? I thought I saw one over here. Okay. Well, I think that wraps us up. We're, we went uh, two or three minutes over, but we're in pretty good shape. Charlie, thanks, and, and I'll let you go at this point, but that was that was great. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Talk, talk to you later.